we're going to continue with a comparative analysis of the epidemic and the public policies in different countries. Mexico and Brazil will be the two countries in Latin America that we'll be analyzing today with two great speakers. From Brazil, we have Professor and Dr. Esther Sabino, who is a researcher and uh, a real expert in uh, neglected tropical diseases and viral diseases at the University of Sao Paulo. She will be talking about the epidemic and the public policies in Brazil. From Mexico, we will have Dr. Carlos del Rio. Dr. del Rio is a professor, distinguished professor of medicine at Emory University, and he's also the just appointed foreign secretary of the National Academy of Medicine in the United States. He will be describing the situation in Mexico, and then we will have an open discussion with the audience. So it is my privilege now to introduce to you Dr. Esther Sabino. Uh, Esther, welcome. Thank you. You have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'll just go back into the this, this slide, sorry. So um uh, my see, well, I, I live in Sao Paulo City. And the first case of COVID was detected in February 26. And our group was able to sequence this virus and this got a lot in the press. But while we were in the lab, what was going on in Sao Paulo was a big carnival with more than 2 million people uh, on the all, all around the city. And so as a consequence of this, you can imagine that the epidemic, although it started later than the other parts, it would move very fast, and that Sao Paulo City would be the epicenter in Brazil. And indeed, when we measure, they are not uh, in Brazil, in the beginning of the, the replication of the virus, we can see that was higher than Italy, France, say, and the United States. So we know now that we continue doing more sequencing, and now we have completed about around 500 uh, uh, sequences analyzed. We know that, that at least 104 introductions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus came from abroad. They started the epidemic in Brazil, but only three of them really grew. And, and the majority of the, the genomes, 75% of the genomes that we sequence fall into three monophyletic clades. And these clades really started emerging in Brazil just the week before Carnival. Um, may I ask you, Esther, are you planning to show slides? Because we're not seeing the slides no? on the screen. Oh, yes. I you thought have, I was showing You have the to slides. share the screen, right. Sorry. I thought they were there. <laughs> sorry. So, uh, sorry for that. So there you the, are. Wonderful. Yes. So, just... Uh, to show the Brazil as the carnival when they are not. And here is the screen showing these this three monophyletic plates that we have. And uh, so when, um, so what happened uh, this, even before this first case was detected, we had uh, already a public health emergency uh, and a quarantine law in Brazil. And as soon as the middle of March, so we start badly, but we soon, uh, uh, the schools were closed, uh, no essential uh, service were closed, and also partial uh, transportation were closed. Early on, about around 15 days after the first case was detected. But, in the middle of March, April, we lost the first Minister of Health, and then the second Minister of Health resigned 
30 days later, and so far until now, we don't have a Minister of Health. Also, there were some challenges in notification. We use a first uh, system that was, not, so we had to move the system. So the notification process had some trouble in changing the systems in the middle of the way. But we did have this system that is uh, being used for a long period of time, especially for severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome. And so we can, and somehow people were used and this data were, has been included in Brazil for a long period of time. So most of the data come from this other system. So once that happened and uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention was done, the, the RT declined very quickly in Sao Paulo and in Rio and in other capitals. So it was key to have this intervention only, only on from the first Minister of Health. But the, the numbers remain increasing. And one of the problems is to have this, when you start doing the, the, the uh, you try to do something and there is always someone putting all the effort behind. So I, I think Brazil had two enemies, the virus and what was said by one of the people who left the Minister of Health, there was a stone in the middle of the, the way. This is a poem from, uh, from a famous Brazilian writer and uh, so I, I tried to put the translations of what our president was saying since the beginning, like uh, there is no reason for panic, it is a fantasy, I don't believe in the numbers from Sao Paulo, chloroquine is very efficient, the video is going away when it declined a little bit, and then I'm not a grave digger, and finally the one that was famous everywhere was so what? And for once like me, these are the images that was worse. You, you see all the people dying in Manaus because the epidemic somehow, and we don't quite understand why, it started really fast in the place that we would never think because it's very warm, that's Manaus. And there he is in a weekend playing in the lake in Brasilia when there were all those people being buried in Manaus. So it's a really bad situation. So this map shows Brazil now, almost all the cities have already notified one case. This data is from Fiocruz and, uh, and they have this site where you can look all the data from Brazil. And as you can see rapidly, all the cities here are the cities according to their size. The, big, uh, the largest cities soon, all of them and as, as of March all had already one case and today, only 10% of the cities that are smaller than, uh, than 5,000, uh, 10,000 inhabitants didn't, has not yet notified one case. So it's all over spread of Brazil. And how is the numbers of Brazil comparing to the rest? So the epidemic, although had this are not uh, high, uh, it, because of this, no, uh, the intervention, that was not supported by the federal government. That's why he took the two ministers. Uh, it went slow because most of the governors uh, could define the, the legislations in their state. And actually the Supreme Court decided. that. So the, the epidemic in Brazil increased slowly, but kept increasing. And now we are have the highest number of cases per day is death cases. When you, when you control, US is right here, but when you control for population, since the population in Brazil is smaller than the US, so we are far ahead in US in this. And even if you count all cases, so you can see that in Europe, the numbers were very high very quickly. Uh, Sao Paulo is moving also and probably shall, uh, will arrive to these total numbers, these are cumulative case, death cases per million. Uh, it, it's, we are reaching there. So there is also another problem here is that we are counting confirmed deaths. But when we, we look to, to severe respiratory syndrome, that we see that there are a lot of those cases that are not confirmed and almost, almost in red here. And this is the Fiocruz data 
And here is the, we analyze also this kind of data. So the study will know in geology. This is for the previous years that are here. And this is from day, uh, uh, this year, 2020. So it's clear that you have a, 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 a exceed that by severe uh, respiratory syndrome with the unknowing theology, which would bring those numbers that I just show much worse, and we would have a Brazil much far, much more near the, the Europe already, and is still going up in terms of total numbers of that. So Brazil is a huge country, so not each uh, state is moving the same way. So I like this panel also from Theo Cruz that has here all the states and in red is the worst week of that state. So it's only comparing the state with, him, uh, with itself. So like Amazon's, the worst week is here. So it seems to be decreasing. Some other uh, um, states are happening the same. Sao Paulo is more or less here and there, but there are some states that are now the cases are increasing. It's like Bahia and Minas Gerais, and those are also big states. So we should expect a real increase in the total number of cases uh, in Brazil. So just to give an idea, this is for the city of Sao Paulo. So this is a study that we are running in the blood bank. This is also uh, the blood bank in San Francisco is the REDS program. And we can see that the numbers are increasing. So it was 2.6% uh, in April, so zero positive cases to 5% in May and 11 in June. And we are now running the numbers in July. This is using Abbott test. So we have an idea how the epidemic is, in, is uh, evolving. And maybe it's uh, another uh, way that uh, since now everybody's running these assays, we can compare one city to the others. So the good news is that the city of Sao Paulo is starting now to decrease the numbers. This is a side number, it's not a big decrease, but at least for the last two, three weeks, the numbers of deaths are declining, even if you consider only the cases, the, all the static deaths and not only the confirmed deaths. But in land or the state of Sao Paulo, we are still the, seeing the numbers increase. So I like this, this, this is another way of seeing how things are, are going, that in the state of Sao Paulo, there is a way to control Anybody who needs to be transferred from one hospital to another or needs an intensive care unit in another hospital, this is all centralized and they have this database. So we can see that in the city of Sao Paulo, the requests for transferring patients are declining and in lands, the, the, the numbers are, 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 are going up. So it's another way to say at least in the city of Sao Paulo, the number seems to be declining now. This is also give you a view, uh, an overview of how the RT is moving in the city of Sao Paulo and in inland Sao Paulo. So we can see that we, we were able to download but never reach a number be below one. So that caps the epidemic not growing very fast, but always the same number for a long period of time. And I think this is the difficult thing in a place of, like Brazil, with all the political issue to keep it for so long. So here is a, so the state of Sao Paulo started to reopening, reopened the, 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 the state, and actually they did that uh, in May for some reasons, and, and uh, they opened and then they get, got worse and they closed again, and now we are reopening just this region of the city of Sao Paulo and, and nearby uh, places. So this is the last slide just to show, this is the data of mobility of the city of Sao Paulo. And although th there was this decision of opening, the, the movement didn't increase very fast. So this is how it was the normal. So we, we reached 58%, it declined, 
but it, I think people are still afraid. And even if the, the government decide to open the restaurants, most of them are not really full and people are afraid. And it seems that they are still staying at home uh, as much as they can. So we can see this, they, these numbers fluctuate and eventually only in the weekends that you have the, the best uh, decline in mobility. But at least uh, this just not uh, went full, completely full after they start opening. So this is just to thank all the people who help. This is a project is together with the Oxford University, the sequencing part and the data analysis uh, with MRC. And we also have this data group uh, with NHLBI and the REDS program together with the uh, people in San Francisco. Thank you. On the contrary, thank you so much, uh, Esther. That was a fabulous uh, presentation. I know we will have many questions for you. Uh, we will be um, allowing presentations, uh, questions, sorry, uh, towards the end. Uh, so if uh, people can start placing in the Q&A their questions for both Dr. Savino and Dr. The Rio, when he finishes, um, Colin Boyle will kindly help us in uh, monitoring and moderating the Q&A session. Uh, may I ask uh, Carlos uh, to have the floor now? Uh, thank you, Jaime, and thank you uh, for the invitation to be with you today. Uh, what I want to do over the next couple minutes is sort of provide an up update of where things are in the in the COVID epidemic in Mexico. Uh, the the Ministry of Health official site uh, has this map uh, this morning, and this is the latest map with over 300,000 cases in Mexico, and you can see there by different places where the most effective regions. And it really, the first thing you realize is that it's really throughout the country that there's no one region in particular, one state in particular that has less cases than others. The, uh, the cases, the areas with a lot less cases, for example, uh, Baja California Sur is also an area that is not very highly densely populated. This is, uh, so what is the daily confirmed cases in Mexico? And you can see here from uh, a graph from our world data that you can see that the number of cases uh, per day uh, lately is fluctuating anywhere between uh, four to 7,000 cases, but the overall uh, data shows an increase in the number of cases. Now, I must say though, that when you look at the neighbor to the north, which is you know the United States where I live, is this is really dwarfed by the cases here in the US where you know we used to be at around 20 to 30,000 cases, but starting mid-June to uh, late June, we started to see a rapid increase. And right now in the United States, we're overpassing 60,000 cases per day, and we may be very well reaching 80 to 100,000 soon. So obviously the epidemic in Mexico is much less severe than the one we have here in the United States at present. And now, so where are we in Mexico? Are we bending the curve? And you can see from this graph that we really aren't. I mean, the curve is still in a trajectory of increasing number of cases. And in fact, when you see about what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing you know, ongoing uh, increase in number of cases. And we are seeing a bit of a decrease in the, in, the, in the expansion of the epidemic. So the number of cases have increased now at an average of about five to seven days per, uh, a very doubling at a rate of about five to seven days. Now, where are we in the no a number of deaths that have occurred? Well, the daily deaths in Mexico uh, fluctuated, you know, are roughly around 500. But as we can talk later, there's clearly uh, concerns about underreporting, and I think you have to really look at excess mortality, which is not reported in this in this data. Now, that daily uh, daily confirmed deaths from COVID, uh, is, you can see it here, and again, fluctuates anywhere between, you know, 400 to up to 1,000. But it has been pretty steady and not making much of a change. And you can see compared to other countries in the region, there's Brazil that has a much higher mortality, but Mexico comes right below it. And then you can see Peru, Chile, and Ecuador down there. Now, one of the issues that has characterized Mexico is a very different testing approach. And you can see here in blue uh, countries where they're doing open public testing, in which there's a lot of testing, including of asymptomatic individuals. Uh, 
other uh, places in the world, like for example, most of a lot of Europe and Australia are testing anyone with symptoms. And, uh, and then you have uh, and places like Mexico that are just, or Brazil that are just testing symptoms and key groups. And finally, there's some countries that are not doing much testing. But clearly one of the things that you've seen in Mexico and you can see, and you can see well in this graph, is that the number of tests done in Mexico, the daily tests compared to the, to the uh, new cases, you can see it here where Mexico is. We're actually at a rate in which our number of tests is not very high. For the for the for the kind of a, the type of epidemic we're having, and in fact, the reality is, in Mexico, the number of, of tests that are positive is now getting close to sixty percent, which means that you're really testing highly symptomatic individuals. You're really not testing a lot of low symptomatic or asymptomatic individuals because instead of bringing that positivity rate down, you're actually keeping keep going it up. And I think one of the challenges that Mexico has had is actually not enough testing. So what have been the policies and interventions that have occurred in Mexico? And what has been Mexico's response? Well, you know, I look at this poster back in March, this is from the city of Mexico City. And again, Mexico City itself is as big as many countries. And you can see here in Spanish that says, you know, COVID-19 is not an, an emergency situation. There's no need to cancel events. Uh, you don't need to go out shopping. Uh, and you know you know, can continue your normal activities, uh, and don't worry, this is not a serious disease. So I think you know a, a lot of the messaging was uh, was to to downplay the the uh, the significance of this problem, especially early on. And I think uh, you know we talked about this this jornada de sana distancia and social distancing or sana distancia. It really means about how do you spread the community and how do you make the community spread out. And we know this works because it's, it's a very powerful approach. As you have, uh, as you have less, uh, you know, in this disease, when you have one person infected at the end of about five days, if you don't do anything, you know, two and a half people will be infected, and at the end of 30 days, you'll have about 406 people infected. But if you decrease contacts by about 50%, then one person turns into 1.5 people, and then at the end of 30 days to 15 infected people. But if you're able to decrease contacts by 75%, then you even decrease transmission less. So I think the exponential growth and the power of social distancing has been grossly underestimated in this epidemic. And we know that social distancing works. And I want to mention this paper that came out in, uh, in, in BMJ just actually, I think it was yesterday or today, showing its, its analysis of, of uh, social distancing, physical distancing interventions in coronavirus incidents in 149 countries. And you can see here different interventions, S1 meaning school closures, X2 meaning workplace closures, S3 meaning uh, restrictions and mass gatherings, S4 public transport closure, and S5 uh, meaning lockdowns. And you can see that if you implement all five interventions, you're really, your incidence really goes way down and you dramatically decrease transmission. And depending on what you do and how you do it, the changes happen. And one, one point that I want to make is that really the, the public transportation closures don't make much of a difference compared to some of the others. So obviously, lockdowns are the most powerful ones. But physical distancing interventions actually can reduce by 13% the incidence of COVID-19. And the earlier implementation leads to greater reduction. So the sooner you implement these measures, the better you are. So what, what was the problem in Mexico? Well, the problem in Mexico is that we had leadership that was, was not sending the right message. And here I just co paste, copied and pasted a few of them, you know, which you have the president of Mexico saying, you know, don't worry about coronavirus. You can still continue hugging and kissing people. Nothing happens. Or one that he's saying, you know, how do you protect yourself from coronavirus? Well, you know, you use a, a little card because this is, this is what's going to protect you. And we are all honest, and if you're honest, you're going to be protected from coronavirus. Uh, and then saying, "Well, we have the capacity to 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 make to to deal with this. This is nothing serious. This is not fatal. This is not even as bad as influenza happens to be." Uh, and most recently, the 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 president has come up with a sort of a the Ten Commandments of how to get out of COVID-19. And while some of them make sense, like you know, keep yourself informed. Uh, there's a lot of things in here that make absolutely no sense. And I think, again, it's a message that really is not uh, uh, the right message to be given at a, at a serious situation like this. 
including, for example, telling people to, uh, to be optimistic and to find their spiritual place. And I want to end just by talking about, about face masks, because face masks have not been something that the president has been in favor of. And like the President Trump, like Bolsonaro, like many other leaders, you know, they have been saying, I don't wear a face mask. And this is one of the few times that we've seen the president of Mexico wearing a face mask. And that's because he actually got on a commercial flight coming to DC and he had to wear a face mask. But, but face masks make a big difference and we know they work and we know they can reduce transmission. And in fact, there's very good data that face masks actually not only uh, lead to declines in, in infection, but also, uh, but also can help the economy open, fa open faster. And there's data from Goldman Sachs to say that. So this is from the Institute for Healthcare Metric and Evaluation, showing again if Mexico implemented mandatory face masks, that it could easily decrease the number of deaths they would see. And you know, again, this is scary. This is saying that by November 1st, Mexico will see over 100,000 deaths from coronavirus if we do, don't do anything differently. The other worry that I have about Mexico is that we really haven't paid attention to our healthcare workers and protection of healthcare workers has not been a priority. And in fact, one in five COVID cases in Mexico are among healthcare workers. So I want to end by, by quoting our, our mutual friend, Jaime, Jonathan Mann, who, as you know, has now died several years ago. But I, this is one of the phrases I liked the most of him when he said, you know, when he was talking about the HIV epidemic, and he said, our responsibility is historic for when the history of AIDS and the global response is written, our most precious contribution may well be that at the time of plague, we did not flee, we did not hide, we did not separate. And I would say that the same applies to the history of COVID, that I think when the history of COVID is written, our most precious contributions will be that at this time, we did not flee, we did not hide, we did not separate. And I want to again pay homage and tribute to healthcare workers and to public health workers and frontline workers who are really doing an enormous job in a very difficult time. And they're not fleeing, they're not separating, they're not hiding, they're doing their work. And, and our job is to protect them and make them safe in their jobs. So what are my conclusions? I think my conclusions when I think about the epidemic in Mexico or the epidemic in the US is that things are gonna get worse before they get better. And I think there makes absolutely no point to try to minimize the problem. That we need to continue to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. But hope is not really a strategy. You have to have a strategy. And I don't think any of our two countries have really had a strategy. We've been going, you know, sort of bumping from here to there without really having a clear strategy of where to go. I think this is going to be, we need to prepare for the long haul because there is going to be a significant pain. We need to protect our elderly. We need to protect our healthcare workers. Uh, we need to be prepared for some of our friends, families, colleagues to get infected and maybe to get in the hospital and even die. And we need to provide psychological support and counseling uh, to people because the population is getting, is getting desperate and this, you know, unemployment is hitting and a lot of problems are happening and, and mental health support is, is important. But I do think we can make a difference as persons, as society, as healthcare workers. Uh, we, we have to promote social distancing. We have to promote universal face masking and we need to make sure that those who are sick or have symptoms stay home. But at the same time, as somebody involved in research, I can tell you that research is a way out. This is gonna pass, we will have a vaccine, we will have therapies, it's just a matter of time. So we also need to be hopeful about the future and we need to be optimistic that things at the end of the day are gonna get better. And with that, I'll end and, and happy to take any questions. And again, I want to mention at the end that, you know. I like this phrase from Ben Franklin saying, by failing to prepare, we're preparing to fail. And I think failure to prepare has been one of the major problems that we faced in looking at this epidemic. We have plenty of time to prepare, but all of us seem to, all of our countries seem to say, oh, it's not gonna hit me. You know, the warm weather is gonna take care of it. We're not gonna have a problem. And now we're paying the consequences. And, uh, and I have my Twitter handle. I tweet a lot about COVID and English and Spanish and happy to, to, to continue doing that. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. Uh, this has been uh, a fascinating presentation, both from Esther and Carlos about the situation in Mexico and Brazil. So um, thank you for uh, complying with the time allocated. That will allow us to have uh, questions from the audience. And I can see 
many coming already. Um, so Colin, would you kindly um, handle the Q&A section while I also post uh, some of my own? Sure, uh, thank you, Jaime, and uh, thank you, uh, Esther and, and Carlos for those uh, wonderful presentations. Um, again, people can uh, lob questions into the Q&A box. Feel free to do that. We do have a few already identified for our, our panelists. So one question relates to just the quality of the data. I think between the, the estimates of, you know, a little north of 300,000 cases in Mexico, uh, a little under 2 million cases in Brazil, um, there's a question about just how solid are those numbers and the degree to which we may be underreporting cases and underreporting deaths. Do you have, do you have a, a sense of what the true uh, level of uh, the epidemic is at this point in, the, in these countries? Well, you know, what we know from data in the United States and in other places is that the cases diagnosed roughly represent one in 10 actual cases. So, you know, the reality is that you can probably multiply by 10 or even higher because they're simply, as I said, the problem with Mexico is that our testing per capita is incredibly, incredibly low. And that has been one of the major challenges that Mexico has had is that because of low testing, the, uh, the case detection really has not been as effective. So I would say at least 10 times that, but it may be higher. Mexico. Yeah, I, I, I agree with these numbers and uh, some people are doing now serology all over the country besides our data. So it go, would go for something 10, 30 times the numbers that are there. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things that has been uh, particularly vexing in the United States in the course of the pandemic is the degree to which uh, there's a, a very significant disparate impact on underrepresented and marginalized groups. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to comment on the degree to which the, the same issue may be present in Mexico and Brazil. To what extent are, are um, you know, underrepresented groups, marginalized groups bearing a disproportionate burden of the disease? Well, you know, I think, you know, the, the, in the U.S., uh, we talk about, about minorities. And, and I have to remind people that this is not because one is Black or Hispanic that you're at high risk. I mean, we have to call it what it is, and it's called poverty. And it's called, it's called you're not underrepresented, you're under cared for. This is the poor, this is people who have suffered structural racism and discrimination for years in housing and employment and other things. It has nothing to do with your race. It has to do with the way society has treated you. And I mentioned that because in Mexico, it's not underrepresented, it's just the poor that are heavily overrepresented in this epidemic. And it's because the poor, again, is not, it's because they're poor, they're not able to, I think, you know, teleworking, telecommuting is, is a privilege, you know, frontline workers, if you are the person that needs to go out and, and make a living on a day-to-day -day basis in the streets by selling something, by selling tacos, you can't isolate, you can't do that from home. So, so I think what we have is an epidemic that has found those, those breaks in society of, of poverty, lack of employment, lack of adequate housing, lack of adequate uh, uh, you know, uh, income, lack of adequate access to care. And that's where we're seeing this epidemic. So I think throughout the world, this is unfortunately becoming an epidemic of, of poor people. And I think as a society, we have to think about a way to address social disparities if we really want to tackle this epidemic. Because you know, when somebody said, you know, we're all in the same boat in this epidemic, and the answer is no, we're all in a boat, but some of us are in a yacht, other people are in a bill dinky. Yeah, I, and I agree. It's not only the, the, the problem of getting infected. To be poor, you have more chance, you need to go out and you couldn't stay home. And also the access to public health system, to, to testing, so it's totally different. So this, this is definitely a poverty disease. You know, and, and, and Colin, I want to mention this whole issue of testing because, again, the, the under testing in Mexico is really one of our major, major problems. Even, you know, when you compare, Mexico is doing about 5,000 tests per million population. In comparison, the U.S. is doing about 130,000 tests per million population. And in Brazil, uh, Brazil is doing, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 or so tests per million population. So again, 
we, we are, and Mexico really is having a huge under testing and that limits significantly the ability to, to track the disease, to detect the disease, because it's key in this disease that you identify people and you isolate them. And if you don't do that, then the epidemic is gonna continue. Great. And uh, it's also complicated this testing story because uh, uh, even if you test, you need to test in an organized way. It's not just testing. So there is some regions in Brazil that are just testing and it doesn't make, doesn't do anything with the results. It's very complicated to, to isolate people without having the tools to do it. So just having the test will not uh, totally result. You not may not even improve. You may spend money and, and don't get there because you need that complete. You need a plan. What you're going to do with the test? How you're going to organize? How who is going to be test? What you're going to be doing with the positives? How we will inform the contact. So it, it's a really a difficult task in large region. Right, right. So, um, you know, having a plan, I think, is an important point here. And, and one of the things that's, uh, you know, common to Brazil, Mexico, and the United States is not just kind of uh, rampant uh, epidemic here, but also um, populist leaders operating in a largely kind of decent, with big countries with lots of localized epidemics. Uh, I'm wondering if you would be willing to comment on kind of the role of leadership uh, in these settings and what better leadership might actually look like. Well, you know, I mean, better leadership is a leadership that, that believes in science, right? I mean, I think that, that clearly what, what has characterized the United States, Mexico, Brazil, you know, the UK, are leaders that seem to, 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 to have a, to, to dismiss science and to dismiss facts and to dismiss evidence and to, as Esther said, and to call on, on treat, unproven treatments and to minimize the, the impact. You know, I think that that better leadership in my mind would be people that that actually, you know, listen to experts and then don't undermine experts by making opinions and, and saying things that are that are separate, you know, that are different. I'll I'll give you an example. Back in February, CDC recommended that people use face masks. And Trump at a press conference said, you know, here CDC, they're saying you should recommend you use face masks. But he said, but this is just a recommendation. You don't have to a batch with it. And in fact, I'm not going to do it. And I think, you know, if you undermine it, you cut the legs of your public health experts, then pretty soon you, you have no experts left. And, and you have to realize that that has to be, uh, ha it's, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's really a strategy of, of defeating yourself. You're shooting yourself when you do that. So I would say that in my mind, better leadership is leaders that believe in science. Yes, and you, you need a plan. So you need to think where you want to go. And so if, you're, if you don't have a plan, if your plan is saying, well, don't worry. Then, so even if you like in, in a place like Brazil, where all the governors of the states were not following the, the federal government, you still just having the guy all the time undermining what the people were designed. That, it was almost impossible, especially in the early phase where people don't understand and they think people are lying. It's so easy to convince people that this is not true. And basic things like a number of deaths. So there was all this like a conversation that the, the physicians were making money by, by, by giving COVID-19 diagnostic on the people who died. So, all the, everybody's saying the same thing, all this fake news and people repeating. Uh, WhatsApp has a really power, uh, 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 talking to these groups really powerful uh, uh, in Brazil. So you saw all this, this conversation and, and it's just like a, a, a parallel reality. You can't, you just talk and then people are not hearing anymore. So, so this, I think, this thing I think. is completely. So I think Esther has a very good point. This is the first epidemic of social media. And therefore, it's also the first pandemic of, of misinformation. And I think we're spending as much time countering misinformation and, and, uh, and, and, uh, than actually providing information. And, and what happens is, as the, as the epidemic evolves, 
And as you learn more about the epidemic and you refine what you know, and, and people that are doing science are changing recommendations, it almost feels like the people that are doing that are also doing misinformation, right? There's, there's, this, there's this parallel about misinformation resulting from, well, you said back then that we didn't need to do this, but now you're saying something different. Well, you know, as I tell people during a pandemic, I wish I, I, I knew today what I'm gonna learn tomorrow because today I'm giving you the evidence based on best available evidence. But, but I do think the other thing about leadership is that there, there needs to be the kind of leadership you need is also leadership that sets example and that sets expectations and that provides a, a unifying voice. I, 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 I see how different the leadership was during the 2009 pandemic influenza uh, than what it is today. And, and I see a, 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 just a, a, a remarkably different approach to things back then to what it is now. May I ask uh, Carlos and Esther a couple of questions? This is Jaime. Um, one, in the US we have uh, Tony Fauci as a champion um, balancing uh, the nonsense coming from the White House. And we have also some governors acting as, um, in a different way. Who are the champions in Brazil and in Mexico that can, can counterbalance uh, the political discourse from the uh, presidents in Brazil and Mexico? So in Brazil, the first minister of health was was moving towards it. So he 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 was really pushing and, and explaining things. And although, so that's why he was end up being dismissed by Bolsonaro. So there was this voice. I think uh, the first uh, two months of the, the Brazilian epidemic was his voice, the one really strong. Then it was the governors, but then it enters this politics. And in the science side, lots of scientists everywhere, all the universities, not, not one voice, uh, trying to keep it and going to TV and giving all the time as much as you can, talking to, giving uh, information. I, I wouldn't say in Brazil there is a single person uh, doing that, but. That's how we move, but it's difficult because still there were some scientists, like in the chloroquine, there were some physicians and some scientists going out and, and being the, the ones to, to start the process of uh, not only Bolsonaro, but also some, some local scientists trying to. You know, I think a similar thing in Mexico, I don't think there's one person, I think there's some very highly qualified infectious disease physicians who have been voices. But many of them that work at government uh, institutions like Nutrición and other places have also been a little bit quiet because, because they've, been, they've been told, you know, you could lose your job. So I think there's been also this fear of losing your job as, as a concern. So there's not one person that stands out as a person who's, you know, there's no equivalent of a, of a Tony Fauci, unfortunately. Uh, there's not one lightning rod that is clearly giving the, the opinion. And I think that void of a leading voice, I think it's, it's, very, uh, it's very damaging and it's very disconcerting. I think also the, the uh, way in which the, again, I think the, the fact that a lot of things have become political make it very hard because then when you talk about these things, and that includes here in the United States, you know, if I'm talking about face masks, I'm hearing somebody say, well, you're talking about something political. And I said, no, I'm not talking about something political. Face masks are not political, but the technical has become political. And I think when the technical becomes political, then you're, you're very limited in what you can actually do uh, from a technical standpoint, because whether you like it or not, you're stepping into a political landmine. And, and I think that has been, to me, is the, large, is the biggest challenge in confronting this epidemic is that, is that we, trying to stay technical, you, you, you start impinging in the political, but not because you are doing that, but because the political has actually impinged on the technical. So the line has changed, and therefore what used to be technical is now political. 
And I mean, it's something as simple as wearing a face mask that becomes political. And I, I just don't, I would have never in my wildest dreams thought about a, a, mask, a face mask becoming a political, you know, such a political a lightning rod. Can I have a follow-up question? Carlos, um, you have mentioned in Mexico the lack of testing. And Mexico is probably the country, middle-income country, with the lowest testing per capita. What is the reason behind that? Is that lack of resources? Is it lack of access to the global market? Uh, is just negligence? What is it? I mean, I think initially, it's hard to know. I don't know all the details, but I think initially there was a, a little bit of a, what I would call a, uh, I think different strategy. I think the government initially said, you know, we're going to control the testing, much like what happened here initially in the United States, in which CDC says we're going to be doing all the testing and we're not going to let others do the testing. And then they flawed. I think initially the government said, well, we're going to have this, we're going to use the Sentinel surveillance for influenza as the testing to look at this. And that's fine. That's a good way to look at where the epidemic is. But they didn't build the diagnostic capacity necessary to do testing for, for diagnostic purposes. And they didn't build up the diagnostic capacity to do testing in the community. Like for example, Korea and other places, including here in the United States, we have done, you know, putting testing outside of healthcare systems, drive-through testings, people that you can actually go and get a test done quickly. And I think that by the time Mexico said, well, maybe we ought to be doing some more testing, then, then the global market was out of reagents, right? We weren't a priority for them. So I think it's an issue of, first of all, they could have been in the market earlier, but they decided not to. And then by the time they were in the market, it was too late because the market had been taken over by the United States and others. So it's not one thing. I think it's a combination of things right now. I was talking to some people in Mexico saying we want to do more testing, but even with resources, we're having trouble getting our hands on, on the necessary tests that we want. So, uh, I mean, I think that there's an opportunity as testing becomes more available and tests is developed that Mexico can increase testing capabilities but I cannot cease to, to, to emphasize how important testing is. And it's so important because over 40% of cases of this infection are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And if you wait to diagnose only those people that come to hospitals, you're missing those individuals that have mild or no symptoms. And they're still transmitting and they're still leading to infections. And I think that's the, I mean, the biggest challenge in confronting this epidemic is the asymptomatic and the mildly symptomatic individuals who are still, still transmitting. And until we get our hands on that, I think controlling this is gonna be very hard. And the only way to identify those individuals is through testing. In Brazil, Esther, um, is Fio Cruz or Sao Paulo University developing their own diagnostic tests or are they buying it in the global market? So the diagnostic testing is really dependent of international reagents. So the same problem that Carlos mentioned was the same to us. We couldn't get the re necessary reagents early on. And now we are starting buying from outside and some people trying to produce inside uh, Brazil, like Fiocruz, some uh, molecular biology tests. But we are, uh, this is an area that we are very dependent on the outside production. And with the Brazilian currents going down, the real, so it's another adding problem to, to, to people. So the cost of this testing increase. So I think it's all this mutual. We don't have a local production. And early on, it was very hard. There was just, we couldn't buy it. it, it, it it's, it was all being used in Europe and in the US, and the reagents were arriving very slowly. And also, there was also this problem of trying to centralize testing in the public system, which I think is problematic under epidemic. So this is something that we need to improve when we are outside of an epidemic, how to test at the time of an epidemic, have everything organized. So you don't need to think. So well, when it's number, you need something. How are you gonna do it? You need at least have this, all these steps decided. And I don't think we ever really organize the epidemic response. 
And there is always this thing, you arrive at something and you don't have a place to test. And so somehow I think it's science and all this, we need to establish, even for the studies, which study you're going to pri prioritize in our area, you, you need to plan your science during an epidemic. Decide what are the, your top priorities, uh, how to improve the um, ethical committees to do as fast as they can and also do it the easiest way to do a research and not have the best ethical, uh, but have something appropriate and rapid. And this, I, I think this is something that we move after this, this epidemic, we need to start planning research in a better way. So even in my, in the city of Sao Paulo, where you have a, our hospital has centralized most intensive care units. They had like 3000 patients in our, in this, since, since the epidemic started. Still, you need to plan rapidly which, which um, drugs are you going to test and do it as fast as you can and not to start competing which are the protocols so that you need to think about which are the best protocols, try to do as fast as you can to, to move science faster doing uh, this kind of epidemic. And I don't think we really have this plan uh, in, anywhere. I don't think we... And this should be something to everybody to have plans and have already protocols and have them pre-approved by IRBs so you can start as soon as you, you start having cases. Um, thank you for that. Uh, one, or, one or two questions from the uh, Q&A box. Uh, you know, um, one question is really about different regional uh, trajectories around the pandemic including why uh, Manaus and Amazonia were impacted so early and so hard, and also why cases have fallen more recently in the Northeast. Well, uh, this, is, this is a very hard question. I, I don't know whether you ha would have the questions for New York, for example. Yeah. We don't understand why it moved so fast there. And I, I know that they really, they didn't follow any they were unable to do social distance early on at all. And there were also those boats that people move in the Amazon region and people stay close for a long period of time. So this is one of the ideas that could be, because it was not only Manaus, it was everywhere in the Amazon region. And maybe the, those boats that transport people are the ones that are, uh, were also transporting the virus. I don't know yet. I don't think anybody has a clue for why, Ma why Manaus started this way. But I think when you, are, you have a very high epidemic, as you had in New York and, and Manaus, maybe it just is the natural history and we, we reached the highest number and it, it's just how, how the epidemic would be. You know, one, one thing that I want to mention is is there some important there's some some important lessons in the region, and I think we also need to learn from what has worked. And I, I point to the lesson of Ecuador. I think the city of Guayaquil did an incredible job confronting the epidemic, and what they did is they really put put essentially made teams go to households and stop the epidemic in households. They didn't wait for people to come to hospitals. They really did true contact tracing. They did outreach to the community, they did testing in the community, that isolated people. And, you know, Guayaquil was able to stop what was a horrible epidemic, but they did a very intensive work to do that. So I think what we need is, again, when you say, what do we need? We need to really do public health and we need to do public health in a very proactive way. And we need to not be doing public health in, in a desk, but we need to get out to the community and we need to be where people are and we need to not be waiting for people to come to the hospital, where we need to be out in the community, testing people, isolating people, and really providing people the necessary support so they can actually isolate. Uh, if they, you know, for example, China, you know, if people couldn't isolate in a household, put them in, in, in apartments so they can isolate in rooms so they it wouldn't, you know, infect the rest of the people in their households. So I think we really need to be, I think community involvement 
community partnership and, 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 and community-based public health is important. I also think a concept that to me is really important is the concept of, of sort of a, you know, we talk about a lot about uh, personalized medicine. I think this is time to really practice personalized public health. You know, we need to really think about what is the data that you have? How do you use data to really localize those, those POSA in communities at the zip code level, at the neighborhood level, and then re commit your resources, go there and do what you need to do to stop the outbreak. You need to have a very much of a fire department kind of approach as opposed to saying, oh, you know, we have enough testing in the city and hope people are gonna come here. You know, the fire departments don't work by people going and taking their things over there and then they put out the fire. They go out to people's house to do that. So I think we need to really rethink how we're practicing public health and that requires a lot of investment. And I think one of the challenges that we've seen is, is underinvestment in public health. And when I think about the US, when I think about Mexico, underinvestment in public health and underinvestment in, in access to health is really very important. I mean, when I think about the US dismantling the ACA and Mexico dismantling the Seguro Popular, I mean, there's so many parallels there in how we are undermining our ability of people to access healthcare at the time that they're going to need it the most. Yes, I, I, that's so true. Esther, please. No, no, I, I, I agree. And I think this is a way to go, to, to try to improve the primary care system and somehow improve the, the like more, um, if we had a primary care system with more resources and like informational system that, that they to do telemedicine and uh, even if you don't have the test, if the person is there but start a symptom, they can talk and stay home and someone talk to them by phone and just say keep there. And if you have the test and you go there and do the PCR and tell the family to, to stay home but not allow them to go to the hospital and then try to see a way, how would you keep an eye on this person? Because if the person gets worse, how, how would you make go to the hospital? So something organized that would keep this sick person at home, but not unassisted, they need assistance. So they need to know what to do, they need to receive a phone call. Maybe it's not that expensive, but you need organization and you need uh, like a plan and, a, and systems to control the procedures in the primary care. I think the primary care, even in our state, was uh, let as, as a secondary thing. Everybody was trying to do hospitals, uh, like uh, acute, like to respond to the more severe cases, which was important. But uh, if we had more putting more effort in the primary care, it would have been better. Well, um, I know this is a fascinating uh, conversation. We do have. Um, limited time to continue now. But I think this was a, a really fascinating conversation. It, it allowed time for ample um, discussion. Uh, a reminder that this will be posted in YouTube. Um, this has been recorded. So people that were not able to see it can look at that uh, later on. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Esther Sabino for her magnificent presentation, to Dr. Carlos del Rio for having uh, such a deep insight. And uh, for the audience, uh, I would like to remind you that um, next week on July 21st, we will have uh, our COVID-19 series with a topic of uh, testing and return to work. So that will be led by Dr. Jim Kahn, and we will have an assemble of panelists. And the next one uh, will be um, on August uh, 4. So starting uh, this July, we will go bi-weekly instead of uh, weekly. So on August 4, we will be discussing Bay Area counties policies, uh, comparing what counties in California are doing. So with that, I want to thank again our distinguished panelist, uh, Carlos Ester. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. 
And uh, thank you all the audience for staying with us. See you next week. Goodbye thank you. and thank you. Thank you.